Welcome to Night Callers Radio. I don't know where Lauren went, but anyway, <laughs> welcome to Night Callers Bigfoot Radio. I'm here. <laughs> okay. Uh, today's date, September 23rd, 2018. And we're really glad to be here and glad that you all have tuned in tonight. We've got a great guest tonight. Um, I'm here with Lauren. Lauren, uh, where'd you go? I'm here. We we As soon as we started the show, I had a, uh audience surrounding me. And um, you, it's really hard to explain to your five-year-old that you need extreme quiet for you know, just that 30 <laughs> seconds of introduction because that's when he wants to talk and tell you about everything. So, sorry. Um, go ahead. Did it introduce away. I'm sorry I didn't cover the intro. Sure, sure. <laughs> well, um, I just want to let everybody know that next weekend that we're not going to have a show because that is Lauren and mine's birthday. So we, I, I decided that I'm not going to be anywhere near um, – a computer next weekend, so um, yeah, big sixty-two uh, for me. And what are you going to be, Lauren? Thirty, thirty, twenty-nine 29? again. Sounds pretty good. Twenty-nine again, yes. So anyway, you her join birthday's me? on the thirtieth, and mine's on the first of October. Sure, I'll be twenty-nine again. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'll All right, that. let's do that. So anyway. Happy birthday to us. We're not going to have a show next weekend, just to let everyone know. So tonight, we have a very special guest. <coughs> he is a, um, uh, a musician, and I'm going to play a little bit of his song while I read out his bio. So if y'all will hold on a minute. Let's do this. David Osborne, I think it's David Osborne, is a Bigfoot researcher who resides in Southern California. He has a a lifetime interest in Bigfoot, but has been a serious Bigfoot investigator since the summer of 2004, when he and his son had a face-to-face encounter with two Bigfoot in the Western Sierras in California. Several years ago, David started investigating reports of paranormal activity at people's houses and businesses in California and Mexico. So we've got a lot to talk about tonight. He now has become begun incorporating his paranormal tools into his Bigfoot investigation since the head-scratching experience he had in the mountains of Southern Oregon in June of 2014 on his way to his first Bigfoot campout. Along with his Bigfoot and Paranormal Investigation, David has written a Bigfoot book called Bigfoot Light, L-I-T-E, published on Amazon Kindle and is halfway through writing a follow-up. As a lifelong musician, he has started writing songs again and will soon be recording studio, will be, will soon be in the recording studio with the goal of putting his songs online. David is a retired psychology guitar teacher who currently lives in Chino, California, with his wife, Martha, his two black Labrador retrievers, Wendy and Callie, and his desert plant nursery. So we welcome uh, David also. Thank you for coming on, David. Well, thank you very much for having me on. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I fine. can. I'm trying. Okay, to. <laughs> I heard something that said I'm muted. I heard something that said I'm muted, and I thought, oh, I don't think I'm muted. <laughs> okay, I'm doing really good. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> okay. So I don't know, Barry. Would you like me to start? I guess you have some questions for me. Just start firing away. <laughs> I we'll do. Kind of... So we usually just start at the beginning. Our standard question to start out the interview mm-hmm. is, "What got you into this topic?" Well, probably like a lot of people, I was really captivated the first time I saw the the single shot from the Patterson-Gimlin film. And actually, if I remember correctly, I really would have to go back and look at the L.A. Times, but 
I was a teenager back in when the, the year it happened. I was in high school, and I think on the LA Times they actually splattered. They had the whole big front page had a big picture of Bigfoot on the front, and it had this big article about you know Patterson Gimlin and finding this thing up there. And I was just mesmerized and captivated. And ever since that time, I was interested in Bigfoot. But you know, living where I did in Southern California, there's not, in my opinion, really any Bigfoot activity. Although there's probably a few people that would disagree, but I, you know, I know how it is when you live somewhere your whole life, you know the stories and the legends and, you know, what's going on. I've just never heard anything to me that's consequential enough to make me really believe there's a lot of them there, although somebody's convinced there might be a few. But anyway, I realized that I had to get further out and uh, start looking at stuff. So probably in uh, 1990s, I got a really cool Jeep Wrangler and used to take my wife, this of course before we married, and various girlfriends, because I was still single, go up and hang out in uh, Willow Creek and stay on the Indian Reservation in Hoopa and then drive up into Bluff Creek. And uh, As I was talking to Kit Morrell the other day, I really didn't know what I was doing at the time. He goes, well, nobody knows still what they're doing a lot of the time. I said, but I didn't know anything. I hadn't been schooled. And so um, it was after uh, Kathy and Bob Strain kind of took me under their, their wings and, and uh shared with me some of their areas up there that that's when my son and I had our experience in 2004 and I was almost ready to pack it in by then until that experience and that's what kind of really catapults me to my next level of really you know being serious where I was you know buying a camper and going out and really you know just hanging out with people and just soaking up everything I could and you know figuring out where the areas were so but yeah it gets back to the uh, the, seeing that, that picture on the front page of the L.A. Times is kind of, I thought, wow, there's something like that out there. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. Well, yeah, um, kind of I think yeah. Lauren is distracted. She is <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and step in real quick. <laughs> Five-year-olds can be pretty distracting. I know. Oh, <laughs> very much, very much. Sorry. And they, and I don't, I don't know how they know she's fixing to do a show, but they'll do it almost every Sunday. So. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so uh, you you started investigating reports of paranormal activity at people's houses and businesses. So were you like a ghost hunter? Well, you know, that's an interesting part of my life, too, because um, mm-hmm. what happened, this is kind of a long story, but since we got a long time, I, I, it's get, I'll go ahead and share it. But um, mm-hmm. when my wife and I first got married, we had bought this really nice house, and it had, like, four bedrooms in it. And the back bedroom, which was an add-on, had had some water damage on the wooden floor. So, it was, But it was a really big bedroom. It had a big walk-in closet and bathroom. And so when my son was born, we moved back there, so we'd have the bassinet and everything right there. And uh you know, so we could hear him cry. And uh, it was at that time we were living back there, and I, I did not believe in ghosts at all. You know how people say, oh, Bigfoot's a bunch of baloney. There's no way I'll ever believe in it. Well, that's the way I was with ghosts. I thought anybody seen a ghost, uh-huh. they had too much to drink or they're on drugs or imagination. So I totally had – I was like – that's when people don't believe in Bigfoot. I totally understand because that's why I was with ghosts. But anyway, we had moved into that room, and for the next two years, I started having really strange things happen to me. Um I would have once or twice a week, I would have a dream where the bed was being shaked. I would feel in the dream that there was this presence, and I would just kind of almost be frozen in fear in my dream. And all of a sudden, I just feel the bed shaking violently, and my wife would go, wake up, Dave, wake up. She'd be really pissed at me because she always got up with Jacob, you know, in the middle of the night when he was little. To, you know, so here she was you know, being deprived by sleep by her, by her baby, and then on top of that, be waking her up and – and uh, so, and I had some other things happen. I actually got cancer when I was living there at the house, which I'd never had any problems with that. And luckily, I was cured. Wow. I had serious cancer while I was there. I had terrible back problems that I'd never had before, to the point two or three times at least when I was getting ready to go to work, the pain would just like shoot through my body and my back, and I would just, I passed out. I fainted on the ground. And so the doctors wow. could never find anything wrong with me at all. They couldn't find any. And I went to you know, all this therapy and stuff, and it was just really weird. So finally, we, we sold that house, and, and before we bought our house we have now, we took care of my father-in-law. I had to cut him a big ranch out here in Chino. And we moved into that house, and I just kind of forgot about everything, and everything disappeared. My back got better. You know, my cancer didn't come back. Um, and I totally forgotten about that whole experience because – because at the time, I just I used to say, I, I feel like there's a ghost scene in my life. Go, oh, that's a bunch of blind. I go, yeah, but it feels that way. 
blue one. My wife was mm-hmm. talking, ran into the lady who owned the house before us. And it was a friend of hers that she was, who was a nurse with her because she's in, my wife's a nurse. And uh, she's going, yeah. She goes, I don't know. But for a while, I thought Dave was going nuts there at her house. And Gail goes, why? She goes, oh, he kept on saying he thought there was a ghost back there. And this lady's eyes got white as saucers. She goes, she goes Martha, <laughs> there's a ghost back there. She goes, what? She goes, oh, yeah, I saw it. She goes, this is a mean ghost. My husband, my ex-husband thought I was crazy too, but there was a ghost back there. So that kind of triggered my imagination. Like, okay, oh, now yeah. – now I now I got some affirmation that something happened. You know, it's like well, it wasn't just me thinking this. So um, at that point, I started doing some investigating. The, the internet was still pretty primitive back then, but there's starting to be stuff on there, and started and there weren't a lot of ghost shows and stuff like there are now. So I had to kind of scratch around, but uh, I I came to the conclusion that something was going on at that house, and I never could find any history about you know why that that part of the house was bad and the other part wasn't. But, you know, even the typical stuff, the room always seemed really cool in the summertime, so it was a nice room to stay in and, and write and stuff. But it, mm-hmm. it, so, so anyway, um, after that happened, I just, just like Big but it kind of picked, picked my curiosity. And it just happened to some friends of mine that I've known for years um, were staying at a house in Pomona, this friend's house, and they swore up and down it was haunted. They had seen all these – she had seen some apparitions there. So I bought my ghost hunting equipment over for my first – Ex investigation and um, uh-huh. what happened? <laughs> it, it, it's really crazy. So I had like, if you see the TV shows, the mail meters where they get the readings and and the voice yeah, boxes, yeah. and I had all that stuff. Well, it was right around the holidays, and they had this old snow globe. It was like a New Year's snow globe, like, like the Happy New Year's 1995 that they got at a swap meet. It was sitting on the table in this house, and um, and uh, it was like like a little New Year's baby with this little kind of like semi naked with a little wrap swing, swinging off off of it and this little little, little <laughs> village with snow kind of on it. And as I'm putting my equipment together, this is the very first time I ever, I just had bought it and was putting it together on the table, the snow globe, all of a sudden the snow globe just starts bubbling up. And it's like this perfect symmetry and there's little air bubbles kind of coming out of the water and all the snow is kind of bubbling up and kind of slightly coming down. And I'm thinking to myself, that's really cool. The snow globe must be like on a timer or you know, a battery yeah. or something. <laughs> and so I, I get done with the investigation, and, and we were getting some really good readings in the house, and there's one room that nobody wants to go in, and the people go in the bathroom, and they have to have somebody stand outside or so scared, and it really is a weird room. But anyway, this is the, this mm-hmm. is the dining room. So I'm getting done. I'm telling Jim and Laura, I said, oh, I said, what's wrong with that snow globe you guys got? And they go, oh, we just got it to swap me today. I said, oh, I said, is it electric or has it got batteries? And they go, no. I go, why? They said, why? I said, well, it was bubbling up, and and uh, my friend goes, no, there's not even – that thing's dead in a doornail. So we, we investigated it. Sure enough, there, there was no batteries and there's no plug. And my friend goes, well, he, he was more of a skeptic than his wife was. And then he goes, well, maybe you were rattling the table when you're putting the batteries in. I said, no, it was so perfectly smooth. So I actually redid – every. they were there with me, and I kind of re-put everything together I was doing to see if it affected the snow globe. And, you know, it was like a little puff one up here and there, but – I, I think whatever was at the house there uh, mm-hmm. was was screwing me. Like, yeah, you think you're investigating? Well, here's your investigation right here. But I, uh-huh. but anyway, I've got a lot of, uh-huh. So I've got a lot of stories like that. But basically, between that, they have a haunted house in New Mexico that they live in, too, which is just a beautiful big house. And uh, weird stuff happened there. And I just kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, that they are real, and I've had enough experience mm-hmm. on top of that. On top of that, I realized in talking to his wife, who's had a lot of experiences, I'm probably what they call a low-level sensitive, meaning that yes, I can go me. into a place yeah, and, and I can pick up on a vibe. I can't communicate with them. They communicate with me, I think, through my dreams occasionally. That's how they came to come to me. Mm-hmm. But a um, good example, just recently I did the thing on YouTube uh, out by Death Valley Junction. There's a real famous hotel there at the junction that all the ghost shows have, uh, have done shows on. After this, I'll kind of move on off of this and talk about something else. But anyway, um, it's called the Death Valley Junction Inn or something like that. And uh, so I, I, I was camping. We had some property out by Death Valley. I was camping there and using the hot springs. So I thought, you know, I'm going to go drive up here one day and park my camper and walk around see if I feel anything. So I walked around the whole outside of the premises and kind of poked my head in little areas and didn't feel anything. All of a sudden, I went into the, the – there's like two doors that go into the hotel rooms and the lobbies and there's like a back door and I didn't really want to be real obvious about it. So I kind of walked through the back hallway and the minute I walked in, I just felt like this 
the same thing I've felt anywhere I've been in this place where it's like it's almost like the air just feels different. It's it's a hard thing to explain. You just feel that something, there's something in the air. Yeah, it's really weird. Yeah. So I yeah. went back to my mm-hmm. car and I took my mail meter out and I walked all around the same place as I did with getting zero zeros. And then I walked in the hallway, like jumped up to like a, I don't know, I can't remember now, like a 4.7 or something. I had it on my little YouTube show. So I would just pop right up there, right where I was. And so I walked back outside and it kind of, whatever was following me outside for a little while, and then it dissipated. So like I said, I've kind of become a believer now about paranormal. And I think through well, that. Well, you know, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I just want to say that that's how I started, oh, too. Do. I was uh-huh. into paranormal and ghost ghost going to haunted places, doing investigations and and things like that before the Bigfoot. And I the uh-huh. Bigfoot was just incidental. It just I just happened to be a witness and that changed me forever on that, you know, but it wasn't so we're like on the flip side of it. We're on the flip side of yeah. what happened. We each kind of made the difference. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. And anyway, well I have to ask you this. Mm-hmm. Um of course, I, I know Lauren was wanting to probably know about your you and your son's encounter with the Sasquatch and everything, and, and we will get to that. But I just want to ask you real sure. quickly, have you ever noticed that uh, paranormal activity seems to um, – that, that sometimes you have a lot of uh, Bigfoot activity in places where you're supposed to be ghost hunting, such as cemeteries and things like that? Have you ever noticed that, or have you uh, – uh-uh. Well, yeah, yes, yes, to a certain degree. I've never really gone out and done paranormal investigations where I had any kind of Bigfoot activity necessarily, but mm-hmm. I've actually in two situations where I was getting ready to investigate a Bigfoot area, I've had what I call ghost dreams. I call them ghosty dreams because they have certain qualities in them that my normal dreams don't have. And, uh, so uh-huh. I think I've, I've been visited in a supernatural way in two different Bigfoot areas that I was getting ready to research, you know, the night that I was rolling into that area. So that's, so that's interesting. That's happened to me. Yeah. That is. In fact, it's really that interesting. Is. In fact, and this kind of, they all tie together, but a couple of years ago I was going up to um, this uh, research area up in the Western Sierra that Bob and Kathy Strain uh, turned me on to. And, um, I knew it's it's kind of, it was not that far off of, of off of a paved road, but it was getting into the late uh, off, uh, middle October, and I so with daylight savings wasn't very much left. I stayed at this RV park that's about uh, a few miles away because I didn't want to have to go down the dirt roads and set up camp in the dark. So um, right. it's in a little village <laughs> called Miwok, and the Miwoks are actually the tribe that lives in that area, and uh, you know, Kathy Strain's book uh, has the hairy man on the front cover, that picture of the hairy man. That's actually the Miwok tribe. Uh, that's where they're, they have a cave somewhere. It's a secret cave, and that's where they have the picture of the hairy man and his wife and, his, and the child. Well, that night, I was, and this is the night before I had some really crazy stuff happen the next two days down at this area, which I, I can't be any more specific and say it's in the Stanislaus National Forest because it's kind of a, you know, uh, you know how that is in research. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you wanna, yeah. yeah if, people share, if people share a special spot with me, part of the deal is I can't really share with somebody unless exactly. people find it, let me share it. So, yeah, but anyway, but, um, so anyway, that night I had this dream in the early morning hours that I was surrounded. I was like a, a, a tribal elders were surrounding me, Native American tribal elders are surrounding me. And I had these really weird kind of, uh, I was holding about four or five of these kind of odd shaped, kind of real smooth, uh, light brown pieces of wood that were kind of very, almost like, kind of like a teardrop shape. Mm-hmm. And there was me and some other people that were in this circle. I can't remember who they were now, but I remember that they were not going to let us out of the circle, that they didn't think we were worthy to be let out of the circle. <clears throat> and so um, I begged and begged and told them, yes, I was worthy. You know, my, my intentions were good to go look for Bigfoot, and they could trust me. And in the dream, they opened up the circle and let me out. Well, that next next couple of nights there at this spot were just crazy. Um, it was just me and my dog, Callie. And um, the first day I got there, we set up camp. And there's a couple of different hiking trails around the meadows and stuff. And... Um, we uh, took this one hiking trail, and uh, I, I I try different things, you know, when I go out there. But I just went up to the forest. There's nobody around but me. There's nobody around at all for 
quite a few miles. And I just went up to the edge of the forest kind of from our opening. I said, hi, I'm David. I'm here. I come in peace. I mean, no harm. If you don't mind, I said, you know, please share with me that you're here. You know, a wood knock, a tree knock, uh, you know, any or throw a rock, just don't throw it at me, you know, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, about 10 minutes later, I, and, and I actually have it in my my next book I'm writing. It's such an interesting encounter. About 10 minutes later, I heard this huge piece of bark just being ripped off of the tree, like real violently. And all of a sudden, um, there was a squirrel that was up above one of the trees. And I've, you know how squirrels kind of send out their warning signal when people come around or dogs. Yeah. This squirrel just went nuts for like a half hour. <laughs> Make those squirrel sounds like he was really freaked out, and my dog just kind of looked at me like, "What the heck?" And I, and I thought, "Hmm," because I've heard plenty of tree knocks in my life. I never heard a big piece of wood being ripped off, and so I didn't. You know, the, there's a lot of deadfall there, and there's no way I would have gotten back in to see what was there. But it was sounded pretty close, and so um, that night I was by the campfire, and it was pretty cold up there because you're at about a mile high elevation in October this year, so it's starting to get cold at night. And I had a campfire, and Callie was cold, so she went in the camper. And I was – this is interesting because I had my smell meat with me because I was going to take on some hikes to see – because there's some Indian uh, grinding stones where old villages were along some of these trails. I was going to see if there's any residuals there. And I turned on my smell meter. Well, uh, okay, this is before I turned on my smell meter. I forgot this. But um, about 10 minutes before I turned on my smell meter, I heard this little – sound like a rock, a small rock being thrown off of a, like a bigger rock, kind of like a ping. And that area yeah. there, there's no loose rocks or rock slides. It's just, you know, real, like a lot of deadfall. Whatever rocks are, these huge, huge boulders. But something threw this little ping. And I, I thought, well, that's interesting because, you know, the kind of things that happen when you're out there. And so I turned on my mail meter because I wanted to see how cold it was. And um, for people to understand the readings on mail meters, on the ghost shows, they get really jacked up and they get a .5 or .6. And most of my investigations, I'm getting way beyond that. But anyway, I turned on my mail meter oh, to see wow. how cold it was. And all of a sudden, my mail meter read 78. I'm thinking to myself, 78? I'm like, oh, my God. I'm thinking to myself, this has got to be a, a, a bad reading or something. I'm walking around with it, and it's just staying at 78. And I'm not even so thinking So is 78 the temperature or, or no, the no, no. amount of energy that's in the air? I'm sorry, no, the okay, melody was reading. What does it do exactly? No. Okay, well, it, it registers electromagnetic energy that they believe oh, okay. the paranormal, paranormal spirits actually put out. And so, no, oh, the temperature okay. was reading like 33 or 34. It was cold outside. So to get a reading, <laughs> you have to have some kind of electrical. Let's put it this way. If you wanted to get a, a, a real accurate reading, how they work, just with something that's non-ghost, because since they do measure electric, you go up to like a – if you went up to like a, a fluorescent light and held it up there, you might get a 10 or a 12. Or if you went to your junction box outside your house where all your, your wires are wired in, you might get a mm-hmm. 15 or a 16. I was getting a 78, which is just – it was mind-boggling. So I shut it off. Off I the thought, chart. You know, this, this yeah. Gotta, yeah, this got i got to check this out. So I turned it off, turned it back on. It just shot right up to a 78. At that point, I thought, I think I have – something here with me, you know, if I, don't, you know, I don't want to get too whacked out about what Bigfoot is because you know, we kind of base it on our own experiences. But my thinking was mm-hmm. if these, some people think they can cloak, well, something's cloaking here. It's, it might be cloaked, but it's throwing out some heavy, heavy energy here. So I just started, I just mm-hmm. think something was there with me and whatever it was. I said, hi, I said, welcome to my campfire. You know, uh, I, I'm here peacefully. Enjoy yourselves. Uh, if you want to show yourself to me, I think I can handle it. And I actually took some pictures on my uh, my cell phone, you know, to, to document it. And I uh-huh. think I got it when it was at 68. It stayed at 78 and dropped down to 68. And then all of a sudden, it just kind of disappeared. And the next How day, was your I dog, Callie, stuff. reacting when all this was going on? Well, she was inside sleeping in the camper. It wasn't affecting her at all. So that was interesting, okay. too. But she has mm-hmm. reacted to things in the past. Then the next day, I kind of did the same thing with the woods and uh, talked to the woods again in the afternoon. And 10 minutes later, I got a real solid, good tree knock. Like, bam, I have to go back check my notes. It's either two or three. It wasn't just one. It was like, bam, bam. And after that, all the blue jays were going up for a half hour. You know, they reacted to whatever that was. But that, I've heard wood knock right. before, and that was the real deal. It wasn't any, you know, big woodpecker <laughs> or anything. It was a solid tree knock. Yeah. And, uh, 
And on the way back, I went to the Native American uh, grinding stone in the old villages that they had by the river. Didn't get any readings, but on the way back, coming down this road about 200 yards from my campsite, <clears throat> I started getting readings by all these trees, which I thought was interesting. You know, it was like in the point two, point mm-hmm. three, what we call pop up readings. But once again, you're in the middle of nowhere, no electricity, you shouldn't get anything. Right. And so exactly. a friend of mine came up a few days later, and um, he, he called me a few days after they were up there. He goes, Dave, he goes, what the hell did you do up there? Rile them up. I've had more activity. And he swore they had had him coming around his tent. And the one he, he was talking about a tree break, and and it's really funny because I walked by this one tree. It looked like a tree break, and I actually got a reading of like a point three right by there, which I thought was really odd. He goes, yeah, there's a tree uh-huh. break up there, and I said, yeah. So like I said, I've kind of, I don't want to say I'm a woo guy, but I think coming from a flesh and blood beginning in my perspective, and having this and some other situations happen when I was out bigfooting that just mm-hmm. did not fit into the the, the flesh and blood strictly box. I've decided that for me, my, I, I've chosen to open up my mind and think there might be more to Bigfoot than just a forest ape, a large forest ape that's maybe yes. just kind of sharp, you know, enough to evade us. I've, I've decided that I'm not going to keep them in that box. For me, for me, it seems more logical to say, you know, what, there might be more to it than that. Well, and I, and I agree with you. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I try to keep it, you know, our, our listeners like us to keep it, scientific but you know sometimes it's difficult to do that when you have things happen that you can't explain and i'll right. tell you something else you being a low level sensitive for some reason that is an attractant i don't I know why uh-huh. because people that are sensitive seem to have more activity and mm-hmm. i or they're they draw them in and i don't know how that happens or why but mm. Also, we've had a lot of things, you know, we've had our equip. we've had like 13 pieces of equipment, totally, ba- total battery drain, immediately. Oh, yeah. That's a real yeah, person. And, uh, said, yeah, and that was somewhere where there was nothing else out there. Mm-hmm. Cannot figure out why that happened. Just things like that. And so, you know, if you've been in doing this as long as me, and some people have been doing it longer, They've all had just things they can't explain, and and yeah. and you know they really they have to say, well, that was is that paranormal or is there yeah. a um, uh, what is the word I'm trying to think of? Um, oh, I can't think of it. it it's the scientific uh, explanation for it. Oh. Mm-hmm. I can't think of it right now. But anyway, we do have a question from one of our listeners. Um, sure. Please, uh, they they want us to ask you if you know of Jeffrey Gonzalez, who is the host of Paranormal Central. Jeffrey Gonzalez? Mm-hmm. No. No, I don't know him. I don't think I've ever met him okay. either. Okay. Well, that was the question. Um Okay. Uh, you know, as, as much as I'm as much as I'm pretty much in touch with everybody in the Bigfoot world after all these years now, even though I've done some paranormal investigations, I've really I've never really gone to any conferences or really gone out with other people. And and it, I feel it's kind of like the Bigfoot world. Initially, you, it's kind of a clicky place until you've been around for a while and get to know everybody. And after mm-hmm. that, it doesn't seem so okay. clicky. And that's kind of where the paranormal world seems to me right now. It's like, yeah, I'd like meet a few people around here and go out and investigate, but there's really nobody other than if you want to pay for a pay for a gig, which I'm not willing to go pay to investigate <laughs> when I when I could do it for free, you know. <laughs> you know, it, you find that, that no matter what it is, there's always gonna be the same kind of clicks, infighting, you know, disagreements mm-hmm. and it, it doesn't matter what field of study it is, it seems like it's going on everywhere. Mm-hmm. And then when you cross yeah over from one to the other but you know it is true that the longer you you're in it the i don't know i guess you just got to get your badge of honor you know after being in it long enough then you start getting along with everybody uh well, you're accepted by your peers is what it is yeah. yes exactly but you've got to get yeah. that in and i remember when i first started i thought i was a bang-up researcher i was getting out there every single day and i was discovering i I felt like I'm the one that discovered gifting. I'm probably not, but you know, mm-hmm. uh, when I was being gifted, 
no one ever heard of it. Right. And, uh, unless you were a habituator or something like that, but I wasn't. Mm-hmm. And so um, they were going, oh, they don't do that. They don't do that. Now it's like, yeah, they do. And uh, mm-hmm. so it's a, it's a lot of things like that. But what I want to ask you about next is, uh, can you tell us about your experience that you and your son had, and uh, just get, just tell as much detail as you'd like to tell. Um, sure, okay. It was it it was actually really the beginning of going where you went from being paranormal investigator, wasn't it? And then this event happened, and you kind of ventured off into a a different journey. So, can you tell us about what happened? Yeah, well, like I said, it happened July 17th of 2004 in the, in the Western Sierras. But actually, I hadn't been doing any ghost work yet. My ghost work has really just happened the oh, last okay. three or four years. Okay, oh. yes, that's a little... Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, so I, all right. Yeah, so I just added my paranormal stuff to the Bigfoot stuff recently because of my research the paranormal and then some things that happened out in the field with Bigfoot that seemed to be paranormal. But <clears throat> anyway, we were out with Kathy and Bob and uh, Tommy Emeron. And another couple we met at the campground, which is about a mile away from where we set up our, our nighttime ops. And um, it's a real, it's a real, uh, it's a regular, you know, uh, forest service road, so it's it's paved this area. But there's a neat little turn out there that kind of overlooks this this river basin, uh, the Clavy River that kind of runs through this area. It's really, it's not like the Grand Canyon, but it really is cut deep over the years. So you really have these wide, really tall uh, cliffs and stuff. And we would do our call blasting out there. And um, where we would set up, it's kind of a choke point where all the animals come up and out. There. You can see cougar tracks, and, and there's not really any bear around, but uh, there's deer and cougar tracks. And um, so anyway, Bob and Kathy, I'd never actually met them before. But they're friends of Tom, so they're going to rendezvous with us at this spot to do some call blasting from where we were staying. So, um We'd had Jake and I had had some weird stuff happen. We were staying at this campground. The first night, <clears throat> there was a host there, but she left. And we were like the only people there, and I was preparing dinner. And Jacob uh, came in. He was 11 years old at the time. He goes, "Dad, Dad, I heard some rocks clacking." And I go, "Really?" And he kind of, and so he was excited. So I <clears throat> went out there and I said, "Well, clack a rock and uh, see what happens." So we did a little rock clack, 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 and all of a sudden we heard this. Clack. Just this one clack, but wow. just, again, there weren't any rock slides or anything. And so we we're like, I, and I kind of blew it off a little bit. I said, well, who knows? Maybe it was a Bigfoot. And he went across the stream and got excited. He said, I think I got found a footprint. And he came back. And and it, this is in my first book. I write about this whole, this whole chapter. It's kind of the book really mm-hmm. is around this chapter. And um, it looked like a big impression way down in the pine duff. And so I said, well, let's mark it for Kathy or Bob or Tom when they all show up here. And, uh, so we marked it <clears throat> that night. We were in the trailer all by ourselves. I think a, a couple would come in. It's a really long campground because it goes along the river. But sometime during the – this was dark. A couple came in on a big RV, but they went way, way down to the far. Well, we couldn't hear them or see them or anything. I mean, so we were practically alone. Sometime during the night, I was, it was so quiet and so dark, I had a hard time sleeping. Somewhere around, I'm guessing, 2 or 3 in the morning, all of a sudden I heard this whistling outside. And it was really weird because all the trees at the time, I, you know, was being a real greenhorn, then I wasn't adding two and two together, but I heard whistling mm-hmm. on one side of the trailer, and it sounded like another whistle on the other side. So there's two different whistles going on. And um, uh, and I'm laying in my bed going, what the heck is that? And I'm going, well, maybe it's birds whistling. But, but like I said, they were, it was kind of off the ground, and the whistles just kind of sound like they're kind of going through the campground, and they just faded off. And the next morning, we looked around, and it was still, it's kind of scruffy in the dust and dirt there, but we did mark off what we thought was some footprints. But and when Tom Yamron came the next day, I, that next day, I, I was telling him, I go, well, Dave says, do you know any birds that whistle at night around here? I go, no. He says, well, no birds. Go, yeah. And he goes, how high, how, how, how high off the ground were they? I said, well, it sounds like it was only six to eight feet. He goes, well, like, duh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, we had that, and we and we did a lot of daytime investigating with him, driving around. We found a lot of tree breaks, which I didn't even know about tree breaks till then. Although I have another side story, which I put – I thought – anyway, because I have so many things going on here while I'm talking. But anyway, um, so we found a lot of tree breaks. Nothing happened that second night, I don't think. And then 
think it was the third night, that, that the night before we were going to go home, Bob and Kathy met us up at this area. They said we wanted to call blast off them. And so we did the call blasting. I think we were using the uh, – it was the, the Tahoe screen. I think Kathy and Bob recorded around Lake Tahoe. They thought might be like a, a little small sap, baby Sasquatch screen before some other stuff. So we played that. It was about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes later, Kathy goes, everybody, so it's actually calm. We were all sitting around like just in a – kind of had our cars at our back as it protects on the back. We were all sitting in, in chairs, you know, camp chairs, and drinking coffee or wine or whatever, and no campfire, no lights on. And all of a sudden she goes, do you see some eye shine coming through the trees? And sure enough, it looked like there was a couple of uh, – Eyes. And what was interesting about what I've always said, what Bigfoot eyes look like to me, is critter eyes are round and have a certain glow to them. But these Bigfoot eyes, mm-hmm. eyes that I saw, were almond shaped, you know, in the darkness, like a human, and they had kind of a, a flickery look to them, light, you know, whatever little light. There was no full moon as the stars that night. But anyway, mm-hmm. to make a long story short, we kind of heard like a little couple tree snaps and stuff, a little like twig snapping, and so. Bob and Kathy and Bob just kind of went all kind of clocked in together, and they told Jake and I to stay back because we, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. And uh, they kind of moved towards the trees, and all of a sudden Kathy says, hit the spots. And they turned on the spotlights, and I think they heard like a tree, tree twig snap or something. But everything was really quiet, and you see these big spotlights looking all the way around and stuff. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, we, set, we came back, and they couldn't see anything. We sat back down. Let's see what happens. And so uh, one more time, I, I was in the spot the next time. It was like a uh, at about looking out down towards the valley and where this little rise comes up. It was more like about 3 o'clock from where the 1 o'clock position was. I said, but over there at 3 o'clock, do you see the eyes again? Sure enough, you can kind of see these two sets of eyes. And so once again, they kind of went over again, and uh, and uh, Jake started to follow them over. I said, get back here, you know. And, and, and all of a sudden, <laughs> they threw on the, the lights again. And we heard, like, think another little snap or something. And then Kathy wanted Tom Emron to go down into the brush and look for him. Well, so Tom went into the brush, couldn't get out, got stuck in there, and he got scared. So I had to go in and, and, and pull him out. And um, <laughs> so anyway, we're sitting around the lawn chairs. And, uh, and, and in the meantime, a, a side note, we actually saw a third set of eyes kind of coming up behind all of them. But most of the focus mm-hmm. on these two eyes. But we did see a third one. So anyway, we were sitting there, and Kat, we're kind of finishing off the evening, and Kathy goes, well, and she was really excited. She goes, you know, Jake, a lot of kids don't uh, ever get an experience like this. You know, so people wait years for something like this to happen. And we, so the feeling in the air, I think, was, was pretty much that, yeah, we, we, this was not any kind of, you know, deer or bear or cougar, you know, because the eyes were higher yeah. off the ground. So anyway, it was really weird. Maybe here's where you're talking about our sensitivity kicking in. We were sitting in a chair, mm-hmm. and in my mind I'm thinking, you know what? I read enough Bigfoot stories, a lot of times they will come back behind you, you know, they'll come back in a circle from the back. And so I just went back to the road. You know, I went behind the cars because where we were, the road kind of is this big curve and goes the other direction, almost like kind of a, not a, not a loop. And if you could be held down, if you just held the shoestring on both sides and how it kind of dips down at the bottom, that's kind of where the turn was. So, there's like a little kind of a, 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 a outcropping there at the top. And there's pretty, well, pretty not too many bushes. And I walk to the other side and look up the road. I'm, I'm looking up on the other side of the road. So we're talking about just a little two-lane road, one lane going one way, one going the other. Uh, I'm right at the edge of the road, and then right at the, where the road is, all of a sudden there's this 12-foot embankment. I'm looking up there, and what do I see? I see those two sets of eyes there just staring back at oh, me. Oh, wow. <gasps> and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, oh, my God. I'm here. They're here. They're here. I'm here. And it was the strangest feeling I ever had in my life. I, I was like, I in my book, I said, I was ex- sky, I was excited, a little scared, and I had, and I was cold, and I had to pee real bad. But I thought, I am not moving from here. I am not moving. Now, in my book, originally, I said I thought I was there about three minutes, and I had a talk with my son the other day. He goes, because he came looking for me. He goes, Dad, Dad, Dad. He was scared. I go, shh. So he sat there, and, and, and uh, he was looking at it with me for a while. But anyway, uh, to get the story stopped for a second, basically he told me when we were talking to him, he goes, no, Dad, he says, the reason I came back to look for you, he says, you weren't just gone three minutes. You were there like 15 minutes. You were gone 15 minutes. I got scared because you didn't come back from walking. So I, I lost total track of time. And uh, wow. anyway, while he's sitting there looking, and we're both looking at, the, at these two sets of eyes looking at us. And it was really weird. You could kind of see the eyes 
kind of slowly close like they're blinking, a real slow blink, and then the eyes would open up again. And then all of a sudden, one of them, and I've seen other people talk about it in some shows, this thing, if you've heard like a bull or a, or a horse kind of snort, and they kind of blow air out their nose and slap their lips like, uh-huh. this thing did yeah. it. Went, uh-huh. And we kind of jumped. And Jake goes, oh, my God. And he goes, let me go get Tom and Kathy. So anyway, um, Tom comes back with Jake the first time. And um, he looks up the eyes and goes, oh, my God, let me go get Bob and Kathy. So while he's gone, <laughs> Jake's still standing there with me. And the thing does it in. It goes, <laughs> and it didn't sound like it was – I didn't feel threatened by the sound. It sounded sound like Mark was kind of irritated, like, he's uh-huh. screwing with this here. And so Bob and Kathy <laughs> came back. And here's where things get even stranger. They came back, and I, I swore the eyes were still there. But the minute Bob threw on that spotlight, it's like he vanished in the thin air, like he just had pooped. Mm-hmm. There weren't any trees or bushes for him to hang around. So anyway, the next wow. day we went back, Bob and, Kathy, Bob and Kathy went home that night. But Tom and I and Jake packed up the next day, and we decided to stop at, at that point where we'd done our call blasting and had our experience to see if we could find anything. And uh, the soil there in the western Sierra is really kind of gravelly and with rocks and a lot of dust. So it's hard to get a real good impression. But it did look like we something had walked through this little game trail, which we couldn't see. And as I re- re- looked at it, I realized that whatever these things are, they had actually used these trees further down for them to so cover and then cross the road where we couldn't see them crossing the road. And they went up this dirt embankment. You could see where a couple of really big things, it wasn't really clear footprints, but a couple of clear, really heavy things had gone up the embankment. And we kind of followed the scruffiness of their tracks up to where that point was where I actually saw them on the other side of the road. And then it looked like they'd actually gone back into the brush from there. But uh, after that, I, even though I, I wish I could say I saw some kind of body outline or something, I did, but mm-hmm. the eyes were clearly all misshaped. They weren't critter eyes. The thing snorted at me. They were obviously judging from where the eyes were from where I knew the ground was the next day. These things were probably seven to eight feet off the ground. So That's still an amazing experience. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Like I said, it was enough for me. People could say, I don't know if people say, well, Dave, you know, not that the doubters and the skeptics and even some big uh-huh. people, well, I wasn't good enough sighting. So I said, well, you know what? It was good enough for me. You know, I, I know what it was, and I was there, you know. So I, that's the thing that bothered me in Bigfoot research. I recognize we, in the Bigfoot world, the paranormal world, there are some weirdos and crackpots, and most people uh-huh. know who they are. But I think, most, I think most people who are out there, like you and myself, are genuinely honest people, you know. We're not trying to pad our mm-hmm. resume. Yes. We're not looking for any special attention. And if I share an experience with you as valid, I think that least people can do it say, yeah, that sounds pretty interesting. Instead of saying, well, blah, 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 Because I would never yeah, do that anybody. Exactly. And I've heard some pretty wild stories. You know, I've heard some stories. I kind of go, that's a real tall tale. But, you know, they, they seem like they're, they're – it's real with them. So I'm not going to judge and say, well, that didn't happen because – who am I to say that? I wasn't there. Because I thought, yeah, I, it's like I say, well, I wasn't there, but I have to take your word for it. You know, that's all you can do. Right. Just, yeah. It was an interesting story. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I try not to judge them. Now, right. I have to be careful, you know, um, right. who I bring on the show. We, you know, we brought on um, Henry Franzoni. Who I absolutely oh, I've heard about him Henry. from Tom Powell. I've never he, met him. He sounds like he a fascinating is. guy. <laughs> he is. He is extremely fascinating. And uh, he came uh-huh. on, and oh, my goodness, I thought the whole world was going to explode when he he talked about his experience. And um, uh-huh. it was pretty – it was kind of out there. But uh, he is – Yeah. he is still uh, – but he he was still a fascinating guest, and right. So I think people need to be a little more open minded. I truly do because it's like we will never know all the answers to everything. There's too many exactly. mysteries in this universe. Too many. Exactly. Yep. Too many. <laughs> yeah, I always so, tell um, people that. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just. I always tell people. I said, you know, I said. I used to tell my psychology classes in high school this. I said, you know, I said, from from birth, we're kind of taught what reality is. And there's this little box that supposedly is reality that we live in. I said, I, in my life, have decided and experienced enough things to make me realize that 
it's just a imitation box that we're put in and that there is mm-hmm. so much more out there. And I said, I choose to push the margins of reality with what I do. I'm willing to say, you know what? I'm not buying that this is just this way or it's just that way. You know, there's all sorts of possibilities here. I also think that the more and more that you are out there in the woods, in nature, it's like um, things happen. Things, oh yeah. More things. You see, you witness to more things. And oh yeah. Uh, I've I've had some crazy experiences. I've seen. Um, I've come up on an area that the whole area looked like it was, um, like one area. Would would have like um, have you ever seen the heat waves that comes off the road? Oh yeah, it would be doing that, and um, uh-huh. we took pictures of it, and it was only in one spot. We walked over there; we couldn't feel any heat coming off the ground. It was the mm-hmm. strangest thing I've ever seen. Almost like um, a vortex or something, maybe, huh? Exactly, or, or I don't yeah. know. I I don't know, yeah. but it, it's just we've had so many. I can't tell you how many EVPs I've picked up on on uh, recording for uh, mm-hmm. audio. I'll be out there recording Bigfoot and uh, or trying to record Bigfoot. There's no one else around, but yet you've got mm-hmm. someone's voice on there. Oh, that's trippy. Yeah. Yeah. I've had one place in particular uh, on the Sulphur River, um, uh-huh. that place is kind of creepy anyway. But uh, yeah. I, I I got about 10 EVPs when I was there. Uh-huh. Just, just single words, you know, just strange, just strange. I, I, I don't know. You <laughs> never know. But we took a friend one time. We took him big. Or we actually took him ghost hunting. And this place would alternate between being very paranormal or being very mm-hmm. big footy. It would just depend. Wow. And that one particular time, we went to take him ghost hunting, and it ended up being big footy. And he said, Whoa. you know, I'm ready to go. He wouldn't even turn the car off. It was that intimidating. He mm-hmm. uh, he was very intimidated while we were there. <laughs> and um, so you just never know. You just never know. Yeah, you know, when uh, we've you had a lot in an area. What's that? Yes. Sorry. Yes. I'll say when you feel something oh. in an area, I, you need to trust your senses. It's like, you know what? I'm mm-hmm. not just getting spooked for for no reason at all. There's probably something that's, you know, because all the year, all the times it's like you probably go out and you don't feel anything. Everything just feels peaceful and quiet. Then you'll go in another place. All of a sudden, you you feel really tense and looking around, and that there's a reason for that. You know, there's something going on. Maybe well, it could be a. A wild animal Some like people a think it's the infrasound. Have you ever heard of infrasound? Oh, I've I've never heard of it. I think I've been the recipient of it at least on several oh, occasions. Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> Me too. Me oh, too. I know. It. Lauren yeah. can also tell you about her experiences. Yes. Well, you know, some people think there's no such thing. And what I thought was really strange about the infrasound was that. At the particular one particular time, there were probably ten people out there, and maybe half of them were experiencing the infrasound. The other mm-hmm. half could not feel anything, but yet they had the effects of it later. Mm-hmm. You know, the the exposure to it, they they were having the side effects of it, and but they couldn't feel anything at the time that it was happening. But the rest of us mm-hmm. could. You know, the heaviness, the anxiety, the heavy feeling on the chest and and I just um it was just odd. I think yeah. it's, I don't know why some and generally women can feel it, but then there are a lot of men out there that can feel it too. And I think it it does also uh tie in with how sensitive you may be. Yeah. So I mean yeah, I'm talking about psychically sensitive. So. Well, here's what happened to me. Uh, it's, it was, actually, I wrote a song about it for one of my songs I'm starting to record. Um, Is but this I had the, to, uh, the head scratching experience? Yeah. Or have you already told but, us that? Okay. Well, no, I actually have a couple of head scratching experiences. But I, oh, I, I would love the, to hear them. <laughs> okay. Well, the first one has to do I can tell the, I can tell you where this place was because it's so hard to get to. If people want to get up there, they deserve to get up there and be able to check it out. It's a place in southern Oregon 
called Bol- Bolan Lake, B-O-L-A-N, Bolan Lake. And I was turned on to this place by some pretty well-known people as a place to go. And Jacob and I went up there years ago when he was 11 or 12. And um, I think we went to Oregon Caves, too. That had a weird experience there. But anyway, um, we went up to Bowling Lake this first time. And a lot of tree breaks there, but nothing else. And I went up there back on my first uh, uh, uh so maybe this is a head scratching experience. Yeah, okay, this is it. Yeah, so there's another one that happened after that. But, so anyway, it was my first uh, trip to Beachfoot. I'd gotten invited to Beachfoot, and I was really excited to be there because I heard it's just a great experience, which it is. It's like my all time favorite thing to do. And it was my first uh-huh. time going there, so I had both my dogs with me at the time, oh, Jet and Wendy. And I just I was still teaching; I wasn't retired, so I'd just gotten out for the summer. I've been looking forward to this trip all summer. So we get up to Bowling Lake. I got my camper now, not my trailer anymore. And uh, my wife had packed me all sorts of great food to make myself and everything. And I got up there, and I suddenly just got extremely, extremely depressed, lacking any physical energy. I was almost so down I could barely even boil water to make top ramen. And I'm thinking to myself, what's wrong with me here? What's wrong with me? Why am I feeling this way? I, I shouldn't. And um, what even made it stranger is sometimes up a bowl of lake, if you're close enough to the coast, you'll get these thick coastal clouds that will come in and just hang over the place, and then it will, like, drop this really thick mist rain, so you're almost cabin-bound. Well, so that's basically what happened. We got the first day, and um, uh, I had – it was not too bad that first day, but it started clouding up. And that night, once again, I had this strange, strange ghost dream. But it wasn't a ghost dream, but it was, it was a terrorizing dream, which I just never get unless they are paranormal dreams, I, uh-huh. I think. And in the dream, it was daytime in my dream, but my camper was surrounded by all these guys that looked like they kind of came out of the Mad Max uh, movie, the bad guys where they have like <laughs> half a mask on them and stuff and all these spikes oh, yeah, coming out yeah. of them. And they're all coming around the trail. And I always, whenever I'm out in the middle of nowhere, I always pack heat. You know, I always pack a 357 and keep a couple chambers empty just in case I make a mistake, you know, but... It's there for my protection. I had it right there by me. And at the time, I, I was a heavy sleeper because I had sleep apnea at the time. I hadn't gotten it fixed yet. And I remember all of a sudden in my dream, it was my camper was surrounded by all these guys that are yelling at me. And all of a sudden in my dream, I can't, they're starting to shake my camper. And you know how sometimes when you have a dream and, and as you come out of your dream, uh, you're kind of incorporating reality with your dream? And I just kind of yes. shot out of my dream because my dream I'm going, I won't say the word. I go, you Dirty mud, boop, boop, boop. Yeah, I want to get you, boop, 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 <laughs> out of here. You know, I was swearing in my dream and yelling. I, I woke up to grab my gun because I, it was like I couldn't tell the like, reality of the dream. And my two dogs are looking at me like, what the heck's going on? What I think happened <laughs> was I think my camper got shaken in my head and, mm-hmm. and, and the dream was all part of that. And it's all part of this. Anyway, so we moved to the next day. We're pretty much uh, – rained in all day just me and the dogs jamming the camper cabin fever and that night i decided to go outside even though i have a bathroom i thought i want to get outside with my headlamp on take a pee uh just kind of look around so i've got my headlamp on i'm doing my business i'm kind of scanning to the left of my campsite and the right and as i swing right and it's really misty so it's hard to tell if what i saw was on a tree or, or free of the tree but it looks like I see just one eye about eight feet off the ground, just like I saw there at uh, at uh, the Western Sierras looking at me. I'm thinking, okay, maybe it's just a bottle cap in a tree, a bullet. I'm not going to jump to conclusions. I'm going to swing my lamp around the other way again. I'm going to swing back, see if it's there. And I swung back. Whatever it was was gone. So, oh, wow. I, yeah. So I quickly took, took myself up and got back. I think, no, I don't want to hang outside. Everything's already too creepy. Well, so anyway, the next day, I was only going to be up there two nights. So the next day, we wake up, and it's really sunny and bright and everything, and uh, still not feeling very good. But me and the dogs take a walk. There's, like, there's a trail that goes up around Bowling Lake up to the peak there, and then there's, like, an old, uh, unused uh, old logging road that kind of goes pretty far ways in. And I'm walking on this logging road, and I'm looking around all sun on this embankment where it's just kind of smooth and not any, anything growing there's this little baby footprint, like a baby Bigfoot footprint, probably not much more than about maybe, oh, six inches. And, and I got my wow. camera. Okay, here's what's so weird. I got my camera hanging around my neck. It's a sunny day. 
I'm looking at this footprint, and I'm looking at it. I start to take, I get the thing, take a picture, and something's telling me, you know what? Nobody's going to believe this picture. You're not going to be able. It's, it's, you, you, why even bother taking this picture? And so I didn't take the picture. Well, so I get in the car, and I get in the camper, we drive off a of bowl lake, and I'm moving on, moving up into Oregon to go to the beach foot thing. And I suddenly realized later on in the day, I felt okay again. So anyway, I have to uh-huh. a full year, a year. Now I move a year forward, and um, I don't want to mention any names because I don't want to embarrass myself. But I ran into this fairly well-known Bigfoot guy who had urged me to go to Bull Lake both times. And I went up to him. I said, "Hey, I was up at Bull Lake." And he goes, "How was it?" And I started telling my experience. You know, I was trying to be careful because I know he doesn't think that same way I do. And I, mm-hmm. at the time, I, I was, I was confused at the time. I, I was still a flesh and blood guy at the time. And, I'm real, and, I, and I told him the story, and I told him about the footprint. He goes, did you take a picture of it? I said, no. And he kind of looked at me, kind of shook his head like, what an idiot. You know, what, what's, and, and I was like, I didn't know what to say. I, what was I going to say? Oh, I was, I, was, I was depressed. You know, I went to, like, I thought, I didn't know what to say. So anyway, I'm back camping with these people I met there, and I was telling them tell how I felt embarrassed about my, my, what happened and what I told this guy. And this guy says, dude, you got zapped. I go, what? He goes, you got zapped. And uh-huh. he basically told me about infrasound and everything. And then it all made sense. And, and mm-hmm. fast forward even further, make it fast forward even further, um, I started putting two and two together after my change of perspective. And what I think happened is I think there was a baby Bigfoot in that area. And the family was residing close to that area because it was so far away from everything. And I think they were trying to push me out. And I, this is a real far-fetched theory, but I, it kind of makes sense. I think that last day they put that footprint there for me because it was just that one print. There was nothing else around. It's that one print. It was almost like you put it there and say, this is why we want you out. Oh. So, because I'm always trying to make sense of why, because I was just up there in the summer again, and there was terrible weather, the really bad, those out here on the West Coast, I'm the animal out there, it's like they call them, meat bees or paper wasps and they were really aggressive and we we uh-huh. were only out a couple of days and had to take off and went to another research area. But uh I kinda come to the conclusion I think that I was I was being messed with. I think uh, I think if some was part of it or whatever they used. <clears throat> but that situation and another couple of situations have just made me realize that I think that they do have a lot more powers than just a, a wood ape that, mm-hmm. you know, doesn't have any intelligence. I, I think we're shortchanging them, in my opinion. We shortchange what these things are I by agree. really limiting, saying, well, they can't do this. It's just like that. Well, yeah, we exactly. don't have any proof that they can or they can't, you know. So I think all bets are on the table still, really. You know, <laughs> but, you know it's the same way with the the uh, the cameras, you know, your game cameras. You know, I, right. I don't know of anybody who's ever got an actual photo or a full photo, photo of a Bigfoot on a game camera. Uh-huh. I and agree. I also I, know I, this, uh-huh. that, that that some people have used them to get get them out of their yard, you know, if they were pestering. Uh-huh. I mean, right. that's, they're like uh, a deterrent. <laughs> they're a deterrent. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> I agree. So how yeah. is it that every other animal doesn't care, but the Sasquatch right. does? How do they know? Yeah, exactly. Um, you think there's a lot more to them, you know? And I, I, I tried to outfox them. You wouldn't believe some of the stuff I've come up with, and mm-hmm. I just cannot believe they're smarter than I am on certain yeah, things. I, well, you know, that wouldn't surprise yeah. a lot of people out there listening. But mm-hmm. to me, as much effort as I put into trying to trick them, hanging the cameras from top of trees pointing down where they were completely out of sight and that mm-hmm. didn't work. Right. So disguising them, making them look like a, a piece of log, uh, hiding them in a bush where I couldn't even find it when I went back to go look for it. It was that well right. hid, but it, yeah. yeah. So, um, so well, I like what Tom Powell said one time. I was hanging out with Tom Powell. We were talking about this is what we're talking about now. You can't get pictures. And he, Tom's a hilarious guy. He goes, well, Dave, he says, uh, I think I got the idea why, why why it's not happening. He goes, why? He says, well, he says, after the Patterson-Gimlin film, they sent out a memo, no more pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well. 
Well, you know, that was the best, absolute best footage. Oh, ever, yeah. That's ever been gotten, you know, and that, uh-huh. I, I still wonder how they got that. I, I know I've heard stories, yeah. and it just, oh, it had to have been. That was the money shot right there. It because was the money shot. I don't know yeah. anyone that has gotten anything close to it. Oh, I agree. Um, yeah, nothing comes close. But you know, you're you're a psychology, uh, a psychologist. Mm-hmm. What do you think about uh, people who, the different kinds of people that research Bigfoot, the psychology of it? I mean, I'm sure you've had people tell you and look at you like you're crazy because mm-hmm. you you uh, well, how do you explain that to them as a psychologist? Why you would so seeking Bigfoot. Well, first of all, I want to say I think Bigfoot people are the most fascinating, interesting people in the world. <laughs> the most interesting, fun people. I agree. I've ever met are Bigfoot people. They're just, I, I, it's just a, what a camaraderie. It's almost like when you go out with people and do researching, it's like you, you instantly become a family in a club. You know, there's just like this bonding. Yeah, absolutely that you right. Like, yeah. And here's somebody else that doesn't think I'm crazy. Oh, thank God, you know. And uh, uh-huh. I, I think I think people that, that – I think there's different kinds of people that, that are out looking for things. But I think the majority of people are – have a curiosity about it, and I think they want to satiate that curiosity with, with more knowledge to maybe understand it. I think people who have had a sighting, uh, definitely that seems – anybody who's – especially the non-believers, you know, that have a sighting, it's almost like, you know, the – uh, Jesus on the road, to, or what was it, Paul on the road to Damascus when he gets blinded, you uh-huh. know, and he's like this conversion. I mean, there's this instant conversion of people who are mm-hmm. skeptics when they see a big, but they're the, they're the ones that are the most all in of anybody because they went from absolute believing of nothing to like, they're the, they're the hottest person around to, to go for it. But I think it's, I think you have some, not too many, I think you have a few people who actually want or are seeking some kind of fame and fortune and and looking mm-hmm. for recognition. They think they can make money off of this, yes. Exactly, yeah. They think they can make money. Well, yeah. good luck with that, of course. But uh-huh. yeah. And I think there's there's other people who are just adventurers, and they they like a certain amount of excitement in their lives. I think I fall in that category a little bit. Cause I think, yeah, a you know, little the world, bit of the world, adrenaline junkies. Yeah. And, yes. yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, to me, I always told, used to tell my student psychology, I said, you want to, want to really feel alive and feel all your senses, go out in the middle of nowhere by yourself. And spend some time. I said, yeah. every single sense goes on high alert. At night. Because you're the only person out there, <laughs> especially at night. Yeah, I said, every <laughs> sense, every little bit of your body is just vibrating you know, with everything. <clears throat> so for part of me, it's just a feeling of, of feeling alive and putting myself out there to um, experience that. I mean, even if there's not a Bigfoot around, I just, the idea of taking care of myself in the middle of nowhere and just, uh, mm-hmm. you know, rising in a sense, you know, going from being a, a a suburban dweller to, I guess you want to say, a temporary mountain man, you know, with my dog out there and living off the land in my camper and, you know, taking in everything and observing. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting breed of people that go into Bigfoot. But I think most people are in there because they have an honest curiosity, and then from there it kind of splits off into some different areas. Yeah. It's usually when a researcher gets to a certain point where he's, He's got to go one way or the other, because there's really mm-hmm. no way you you just don't have to be more open minded, or else you're just stall. Yeah, and, you just um, say, yeah, if it's just a wood ape and that's all it's ever going to be, well, you really close the door to any experiences you have mm-hmm. out there, other than what fits exactly. in your little box. And I've talked to a few people at Beachwood who are that way. They just, so I fact one time I told this guy my stories and he kind of just poo pooed. I thought to myself, well. I mean, that's the last time I'm talking to you about my stories. We'll be buddies and have a drink and play music and talk. And But, you know, I'm, it's like, you know, you got to be open to the stuff that's going on out there. If you want to be a true yeah. researcher. I mean, you could have your biases and your opinions, but be so close-minded not to accept that maybe there's a little more to the story than what you think there is. <laughs> Just like when people, I mean, people say, oh, I'm an, they say I'm an agnostic or I, I'm an atheist. There's nothing after death, you know. I go, well, you know what, I said, I'm not going to talk to you in religious terms. I said, but I've seen the other side, and there is another side. When you die, you will have something else happen. I'm not going to say it's a heaven or hell thing because I don't 
try to go uh-huh. in, in the religious context where the people talk that way. But I say, hey, you know what? I doors cracked open for me a few times, and there's there's there it's on the other side. So you better prepare yourself for something after you die because you're just not going to suddenly disappear and be gone. There's, there's that's right. That's evidence. not the end of it. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> we can argue how, it's well, like how it John is. John Snow the, on yeah. Game of Thrones. They said, what did you see when you died? And he said, nothing, darkness. I'm going, uh-uh. He didn't ever go all Right, way. yeah. <laughs> he was just so. a, uh, I guess, a limo. It's just a, it's a fictional story. But, you know, everybody right. was wanting to know what he saw. And Right. On this uh, on this Bigfoot book, it is Bigfoot Light, right? L I T E. L I T E. Yeah, I did that on purpose because, like, you know how they had Miller had Miller had Miller Light beer. Like my whole book uh-huh. was the idea it was this. It was kind of light, light stories about Bigfoot. And really, what it was is <clears throat> when my wife and I were looking. We I just bought a book and said, you know, how to save money on your taxes. And I thought, okay. And the guy had this interesting <laughs> chapter that if you actually developed a hobby or something where you actually were putting out a product, you could write off a certain amount of your taxes. So I thought, oh. okay, and, I, and I asked, and I went to my tax, I said, did that mean if I, if I write a book, I can write off a lot of my expenses? He goes, oh, yeah. So I thought, well, you know, I want to write a book about Bigfoot. I'll, let's. So I thought, well, let's do a book about me and my how I w- went out and taught my son about nature and Bigfoot and, and our experiences. So that's how Bigfoot Light came to be. I wouldn't say... It was a, a tax shelter, meaning my heart and soul went in that book. Everything I, the book was was heart and soul me. I mean, I was I loved that book and oh, cool. doing it, but but it also benefited me on a financial level. Not without even talking about the small amount of money I made off the book itself. Wow, that is great. And, and, next, and it, my, uh, everyone, it can be found on Amazon Kindle. Kindle, yeah. Uh-huh. Oh. And, and the only bad problem with the book is I had an old old Windows system, my old computer. When I started the book, so by the time I was downloading it on Amazon Kindle, there were some errors that popped up on it because it was an older Windows version. It actually weren't my fault. But um, it's really nice. Everybody's read the books. I've only got one negative review on it. And to be honest, the review was accurate, but it was just kind of mean. But I pretty much got five stars from most people. <laughs> the one negative review, and it was true, and she, the lady complained about the typos, which like I said, I had nothing to do with. And she said it sounded like it was written by a first-time writer, which is true, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but most people enjoyed it. And it, it was kind of a how-to book, like how to get your kid interested in Bigfoot without him being scared. And and the whole book kind of yeah. – I was really lucky enough to have that experience, so that big chapter kind of covers that. Then at, towards the end, I have my favorite campfire stories and some of my friends' stories I've written in there. And uh, but it, it kind of talks to people about you know what to look for. For the first-time person, if you're going out looking for Bigfoot with your kids or just by yourself, like here's some things to look for. Here, here is a good way to kind of figure out where a good area to research would be without knowing anybody, and uh-huh. kind of teach people the right directions to go in if they want to, you know, go out and look for big. But you know, you just don't go down to the local beach or the local forest, and you're going to find it. You really need to kind of do research. Whether you go to BFRO and all the other various websites where they have, mm-hmm. you know, they break things into cat into into counties and states, and you know, kind of do a little digging on your own and create your own discoveries. <clears throat> what what um, I wished I'd had that book when I was introducing my daughter to it. I just kind of threw her off in it, didn't I, Lori? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, you drug me off into it with you know. Yeah. Uh, she, she, she threw me in and uh, trial by fire. Okay, yeah, yeah well, that's a tough way to go. <laughs> yeah, it's not when you're like nine. <laughs> I know, really. Yeah, Jake was the, he's t- 9, 10, 11 when I got to start getting them out there. And I just did real – I class what I call Bigfoot Light. Our first few excursions, we'd camp in a real nice camping area, and then we'd just take day trips up in the mountains and areas and park the car, and we'd walk in the forest, take some hikes, and hang out. So I did real light stuff, but we finally went out in the woods by ourselves. And <clears throat> I remember the first night we were out in the woods by ourselves. He goes, Dad, I'm scared. I want to go home. I said, Jake, I said <laughs> – We've driven a thousand miles. We're in the middle of nowhere, and we're not going anywhere. So you just better suck it up and spend the night because we're not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! I remember one time Lauren said, "It's growling at us. It's growling at us." I go, "Okay." <laughs> no, no, I said it's growling. 
yelling, Mom, do you hear it growling? And she's like, oh, no, that's a semi on the road. She literally lives like a million miles from anything. There's no semi out in the middle of the woods. <laughs> mom, were you just saying that? To, were you just saying that to calm her nerves, mom? Yeah. Yes, I was. Yeah, yeah, you, I was you were okay. Good, I was, I was but it wasn't cold. working. <laughs> no, it didn't work. I knew you were full of it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Oh. So, uh, your second book, what is it? Is it a follow-up? Is it? Um, yeah, it, it, it says it. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to give well, – I have a friend who writes books. Don't give away too follow- much. Because, yeah, don't yeah. give away the title of the book until you have it published. But basically uh, what it is is me now being a solo Bigfoot guy on my own without my son because my son – you know, ended up playing football, went to college and played football, and he was done with that because he was so busy. So uh, it was just me and the dog. So it's really my experiences on my own. And then I've also, when I went out with people, and I've also incorporated some of my paranormal experiences into the book too. So it's it's more, it's, I would say it's probably 75% a Bigfoot book. And then I have a little section to end that's going to be by paranormal experiences in New Mexico and and uh, some other places and the things that happen there. So, but it's funny, I kind of got sidetracked with the book. I, what I do, I go out in the field and I have actually my, my, you just like, you've got that little voice recorder records, you know, ghost voices. I actually also use that as a dictatorial thing. I dictate into while I'm in the field because uh-huh. my handwriting is atrocious. So it's much easier for me to go home and put on my headset and listen to what I talked about, you know? So I, uh-huh. I think that it, it, I've got a, I've got the Tom Powell's been some really great books. I love his books. And, he says you need oh, about 100,000 yeah. words to write a book, and you throw away about 20,000, so you know about 80,000. So I'm at 50,000 <laughs> on that book right now. I'm halfway done. But the problem was, at Beachfoot last year, I met this really – I've met him before. I, I mentioned him on my Facebook post when I put my songs on. His name's Ron, Ron Roseman, and I've hmm. heard he's just this really cool songwriter. And, 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 uh, and we've I've had him on our saying, show, too, both him and okay. Tom. So you're in okay, good company. Yeah, right. Yeah, good guys. Yeah, both of them. And um, so anyway, this last beach foot, I was going back to stay at Todd and Diane's house at the, in the beach foot, so I was helping everybody clean up, and Ron was still there hanging out, and he had his guitar with him. And and I'd heard that he writes these really great songs, and we talked a little bit. I said, hey, Ron, can you tune a couple of your songs? He goes, yeah, okay. He goes, can you tune my guitar? I don't know how to tune it. I said, okay. So I tried to tune the best I could. It was kind of how to tune it. And he played these songs, and they were you know, basically, I guess, called love songs, relationship songs. And it just blew me away because I thought, man, this guy really, really writes from the heart, you know. Because a lot of songs, I've been uh-huh. in bands my whole life, you know, I know a ton of songwriters. And I know how hard it is to write a really good song. You know, people, every every songwriter works their heart out to write a really good song. But only a few really, really ever, I think, connect with people because I think there's this piece that it's hard to get that, what I call that vein going to your heart that just pours out your emotions. And I realize that Ron has that direct vein to his heart and his emotions that comes out in his songs. And I quit playing music, like uh, retired from playing professionally almost 16 years ago. And after I heard him play, I thought to myself, you know what? I want to go ahead and try this one more time. I want to write, I want to give my songwriting one more shot. I want to really, because before when I was in other bands, you're always writing for the band because each band has its own sound. So you you can't write Uh certain songs because they won't fit in the format of the band. So, you're writing for the band. You're writing for your audience. And uh, then you're also writing to get songs on albums, you know, because everybody's fighting to get their songs on the album, the record. So I was doing that. And now it's like I came home. I thought, you know, I'm free to write whatever I want to write now. I want to really try to write from my heart and my emotions and my feelings. Even though I thought I did before, I know I was writing for other people. I want to really write for myself. But at the same time, try to write in a way that I can communicate with people. And I thought, what am I going to write about? Because here I am. I'm 66, you know, and, uh, you know, when you're 66, you're not writing about meeting the perfect girl or the girl meets boy, girl uh-uh. meets boy, you know, it's a whole different world you live. And I thought, what can I write about that can uh, connect with people? And I thought, what, what is, what's my passion? I thought, Bigfoot. I thought, okay. And now there's people who write Bigfoot songs, and all the Bigfoot songs that people write are pretty much about Bigfoot, you know, the word Bigfoot or Sasquatch, or it's real obvious the Bigfoot song. I thought, what if I use the things about Bigfoot to write songs, but never even mention Bigfoot, 
but kind of really yeah. lay it below the surface to only people that maybe know about Bigfoot would even pick up what I'm writing about. At the same time, like, you know, little little signals in the song. And so that was kind of what I did. And, I, and I, it was just amazing the wellspring that came out of me. Because when I thought about Bigfoot, when you're looking for Bigfoot or interested in Bigfoot, I mean, it's a relationship. It's a love-hate uh-huh. thing. You know, sometimes yes. <laughs> Bigfoot shows up. Sometimes it doesn't like the date, you know. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you, you feel discouraged and sometimes you feel exhilarated. All the things that go into any normal relationship. And so that's what I started doing with my songs. And if you, anybody went back and look at my songs, like I said, I just, I just basically put them as you with that song. You put it as just a singer-songwriter thing with this, my guitar and my voice. But, you know, I wanted, I wanted to record the whole song. But what really blew me away, and the reason I'm actually thinking of, now oh, I'm recording, getting ready to record, is that uh, I thought I'm going to put my first song online and see what happens. I thought maybe I want to get 20 or 30 views on it. You know, I wasn't expecting anything special. I thought well, people are going to look at it. And the first song got like 500 views. I thought... Oh my God! Yeah. People really like this. Yeah. Like this is. Well, I was uh-huh. way beyond my expectations. <laughs> and then my second song got 500 views. My latest song that you played is up above 400 now. It's like, you know. Uh huh. And, and so anyway, I'm I'm getting ready to record. I've got like six songs completed already, and three more on the way. And uh, well, even the song wow. that you played called "Let's Give It One Last Try." It's really not just about not giving up a big foot, but one last try, make it about anything. It could be about a relationship, your job, you know, your goals, your expectations. But yeah, every, every single song I've written, it's got some big foot in it. You just have to kind of dig underneath the surface and look for it. Yeah. So I have a great album, yes, I have a great album cover already. My The guy who did my book wow. for me, did my book cover, Daniel Falconer, has a great illustration for my book. And I asked him if I could use it for the cover of my, of my uh, album. And he said, yeah, so I'm going to use that. Once again, I'm not going to tell the name of the album, but it's got a Bigfoot. It's got some Bigfoot. It's got a Bigfoot name on it that only people that are really into Bigfoot will know that it's a Bigfoot album. Anybody else who see my yeah. songs with her, they see the, see the picture, they wouldn't know what the words meant. But they say, oh, that sounds cool. So I'm really excited. I, it's kind of <laughs> given me a whole new lease on my my retirement life, and I because I've kind of switched away from my book temporarily because the songs just keep on pouring out of me all the time. It's just amazing. But, that is anyway, I said, awesome. This, yeah, so this is a chance of meeting with Ronald Roseman and hearing his songs, like, kind of breathe some new life into my creativity. And it's just been just a blast, you know. I'm writing sometimes from one or two o'clock in the morning. They say there's no such thing as a coincidence, you know. Yeah, I agree. No yeah, such I thing. agree, absolutely. Uh-huh. Well, um, you can let us know when you're when you publish that. CD or oh, absolutely. that music? Absolutely. People? Okay. Yeah. So you probably and put it done, on your Facebook and Oh yeah. What okay. what I planned it my son is interesting because you know, I'm in my generation, you know, when you went to the studio you put out a whole album, twelve songs, you know, using ten to twelve songs. It was an album. And I was talking to my son, I said, It's gonna take me a while to get this album out. He goes, Dad, he goes, Things have really changed in the music business. I go to me and he says, artists don't ever put out albums in they might start off with a an album to have like, and they have singles. They just keep on adding the songs to it. He says, "If I were you, each song you take, I'll help you put it on iTunes and and uh, the other services that that sell them." He says, "I'll help you put them on there, and you start with each one song at a time." So that's kind of my plan: just to produce one song, get it on there, go on, and then record the next song. And, and uh, well, it was a, you know, I you know, I see a lot of people that put up a song, and I'll listen to maybe. A minute or minute of it, and I'll click off mm-hmm. of it and go on. But I listen to your whole song because I it really touched me. Oh, it, it was something very special about the way you sing and the way you write. And I just want to let you know that I rarely ever tell anybody I really like your song. And I didn't know you well. had more out there. Oh, I got go a bunch of them. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is wonderful because I I I just really loved it. I did, oh, you. and you have a wonderful voice. Wonderful, well, thank you. Oh, yeah, I think after all wow. these years, I kind of found my voice and my my words. You know, it took me all this uh-huh. time, but that's why I said, you know, to give it one last try, and that's kind of what I'm doing. Although the song is about many many different things, but yeah, that's. What the guy, one of the guys that came over to my house to work on the music with me, he, we played that song. He goes, 
is that because I bet that song's about what we're doing right now. I said, well, yes and no. I said, it is on one hand, but it's not exactly what I, why I wrote the song. It's like, like I kind of tried to write it in a universal tone. That, and when you look at all the great songwriters, you know, over the years, like, you know, I guess I'm really partial to people like Bob Dylan and Neil Young because I like the way they write. It's like uh-huh. a good song. Yep, a good John. song. You put yourself <laughs> yeah. in the song. You, you hear the song and you, mm-hmm. you can write your own. You put your own story to that song. You know, and, and that's what yes. makes a good song. A good song is everybody can relate to it, and that's kind of what I mm-hmm. think I'm trying to do. Is like I'm trying to write a song that has a universal touch for people. Like you were saying, like the song. I'm really yes. tickled to death. I'm I'm very honored. That is and that's kind of though. what I'm that trying is, to do. Yeah. 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 You but know, you know, I a, think that some people they have to they have to reach down and touch the painful parts of their life to get that exactly. emotion into their music. Oh, yeah. You know, and uh-huh. a lot of people dodge that, bury that. But a, a good artist um, touches on that, and that's mm-hmm. how they bring out that, uh, their heart. You have to be willing to share well, uh, part of your soul with people, and then they'll yeah. understand it. Yeah. Well, we don't have a lot of time, but I would love to play the song, and then we'll come right back. I just want to play Dave's song and let everyone hear it. Beautiful. Mantra. It is like my new mantra, you know, because I, 
I researched for years, and then I got into where I had to work, and I was just trying to, you know, and I, I was researching, but not taking it seriously, I'm fixing, oh, I, you know, not as seriously as I did, and I'm fixing to retire, and I said, I need mm-hmm. to get back into it, and this song says it exactly, you know, mm-hmm. you. let's give it one last try, you know, and yep. see what I can learn. There's got to yep. be more out there to learn. Love that. Wow, Absolutely. Oh, God. Yeah, the human I spirit is so not wanting to give up, you know. The human spirit no. is keep it. One more try. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. You have been a wonderful guest. Wonderful. Well, thank you. It's been uh, a thrill I, to be on the show. Had... We didn't think we were going to go an hour. We thought, well... An hour going to be an episode, probably. And here we went. We still have more to talk about after an hour and a half, so you're right. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> well, we'll have to have you back on, you know, uh, when you, you get the CD up and get your book back, you know, when you get back to your book, if you finish mm-hmm. your book. I have a funny feeling yeah. that you may get taken in a different direction with your music. And um, it's if so, either way, we would really, really love to have you back on again in the future. Uh, you've been a phenomenal oh, great. guest. Uh, song uh, you, I love it. I'll songs when the three oh, really? to be recording, so as soon as I get them up and record it, I'll let you know, and maybe you want to have me back on with the songs that, uh, when they got a whole band oh. behind them and everything. So, yeah. Oh, I would You know, they don't even need a whole band behind them, but that is just, you know, oh, it's it's. It's got a, a Bob Dylan kind of alternative sound, and I just love it. I just love the oh, words. and uh, Well, Lauren, did you have any questions? I, I've hogged this guest. We have no, about three minutes okay. left. And... Um, you've, <laughs> you've covered everything, and, and you know, this um, – so, you know, what we do, we uh, tag team interviews, and um, mm-hmm. sometimes one of us will have um, just, you know, a really special connection to the guest and, and kind of take over, mm-hmm. and I'm completely okay with you taking over. You, I mean, it's, this has been a great mm-hmm. interview. Um, I've really enjoyed yeah. listening. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I really enjoyed your music as well, David. That was, you're yeah. very talented, very talented. So. Very, thank you. Very nice. Thank you, thank you. Well, we thank you for coming on, and I guess we need to okay. go ahead and wrap it up. So, okay. uh, David, you keep up the good work on your music, keep up the good work Will on do. your books, and um, keep up the good work on everything that you're doing, because I have a feeling you were heading in the right direction. You have the right mindset to, to well, maybe you. find the answer to this mystery. So, yeah. But thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> All right. and, uh, God bless both of you, and uh, have a good, good uh, week ahead. God bless you too. Yes. Thank you for coming on. Hey, everybody. Alrighty. We will good see night. you. <laughs> good night. We'll see you all uh, not next weekend, but the weekend after. So, uh, stay tuned. We'll bring on another terrific guest and uh, we'll see you then. So happy birthday, Lauren. (laughs) Thank you. You too, Mom. (laughs) Okay. We'll see you all later and have a nice night. Good night. Good night. (laughs) 